So thanks everybody for coming and uh, spending some of your after school time with us. Um, I want to introduce to you Michelle Baruda. Um, she is a special educator. You would never know it. Uh, she has such intuitive speech language pathology uh, soul about her that you probably think she is a speech pathologist. She's worked many years with kids who are nonverbal and have complex communication needs. Um, and is currently working with the TACL program. Michelle, I'll let you talk about that real quick. Uh, very briefly, uh, we were very fortunate to have her with the TAC program. So it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Michelle back to the TAC program. Yay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, I have landed in the TACL program, which is was actually originally started by the Bridge School uh, as a public school program for children who use augmentative and alternative communication. Uh, getting kiddos across the bridge was too hard and too lengthy, and so they opened a, uh, an augmentative and alternative communication program in, that's housed in Oakland Public School. So I am teaching there uh, three days a week, and than doing lots of other things too. So I'm happy to be with you today. I know many of you, it's really hard for me to see because the screen is so little, but I know I've met many of you before and Gretchen let me know that there are some new staff members, so welcome. Um, I had the chance to come to your program last year and I'm so very impressed with the work you guys are doing. And so I look forward to um, being able to be with you today and to learning from each other. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started unless uh, we have any questions at the beginning. All right, so this is uh, going to be, we're gonna talk about core vocabulary today, which I know many of you are familiar with, um, but hopefully we'll review some things that are good to know about again, and also expand and deepen knowledge about core. Okay, so the agenda today is to talk about core vo vocabulary and overview. And we're gonna look at core in AAC and we're gonna take a deep look at teaching with core. So after the class, I hope you will be able to talk about the value of core vocabulary as it relates to students who use AAC, identify resources you can use to plan which core words to teach, and define academic or fringe words with core. Okay, so this is, these are three goals of many areas that we're gonna touch on today. All right, so what is core vocabulary? Core is a small set of simple words in any language, right, that uh, are used across context. So words like go or mine. And this is defined by um, Bruce Baker and Russell Cross in a study in 1997. And fringe is, refers to vocabulary that is more specific to a topic, environment, or individual, right? So fringe vocabulary is not generic and will likely not be used across environments, but in a certain setting with certain communication partners. Okay, so like astronaut or soccer or selfie, or Hanukkah or sit up. Personal vocabulary can be considered fringe and relates to personal words someone might need for their individual needs, interests, work, school, or community. So um, I had the pleasure of going to uh, the Semantic Compactions uh, conference that they host every month and learned about CORE in this way, and it was really formative for me. So I'm gonna share with you a few of Bruce Baker's slides uh, around corpus linguistics and what it tells us. So a corpus consists of a data bank of natural texts compiled from writing or a transcription of recorded speech. So the software analyzes the corpora and lists the results. And the main focus of corpus linguistics is to discover patterns of authentic language through analysis of actual use. So essentially, um, a corpus is a group of words that has been stored, <laughs> either spoken text, 
natural text, written, anything. And linguistics takes a look at that vocabulary and tries to find the patterns, right? So English has lots of words, um, but studies show that 350 specific words make up 80% of, a words of, of the words of a document or of a speech sample, okay? So even though the English language has this huge amount of vocabulary, 80% uh, of the words in a document or a speech sample uh, are composed of just 350 specific words. And 350 most frequent words in a person's daily speech account for 80% of the actual words spoken, okay? So even though the core vocabulary of 350 to 400 words makes up more than three quarters of what adults and children say, it has not always been the central focus of most AAC systems, okay? Um, so, and what I mean by this is you'll see lots of category-based systems in the history of AAC that uh, focus a lot on names of zoo animals and colors and farm animals and, um, gosh, you know, lists and lists and lists of fringe vocab vocabulary that children and adults are expected to use and find and say. And really, three quarters of what children and adults say are not made up of those fringe words. They're made up of core words, okay? So core vocabulary is consistent across clinical populations, activities, places, topics, and demographic groups. And we're gonna take a look at some of the research that supports this claim. And the other thing, and probably the main reason why uh, the central focus of AAC systems has not been core, um, in the past is that it contains few picture producers. So we're gonna take a look at iconicity and symbols and really a look at why that is, okay? All right, so a typically developing two-year-old child might use 2,000 different words in a day. A 10-year-old might use five to 7,000 words in a day. So if you think about that, when you're thinking about programming or working with a child, who uses AAC, um, that's a lot of words to try to get into a system, right? And so the utility of understanding core and understanding what the core words are that make up 80% of what most people say all the time, um, the utility of it is that we don't have to program 2,000 words or 5,000 words um, in order to be able to get across most meanings, right? So we need to work to kind of get away from programming too much fringe and content-specific vocabulary. It's going to save us lots of time, and it also gives students more practice using core to describe concepts. So I am just going to, I think Chris has provided these articles for you um, in your resources. I'm not sure if you've already received that email or you will be getting it shortly, but the research is overwhelming that across, uh, across age groups and demographics, the core words are really, really similar. So um, this is a list of some of the resources that, that prove that point, and you are more than welcome to take a look at some of these vocabularies that they've come up with. Um, and uh, it's, it's, helpful in, um, it's helpful in looking at what words to teach, and it's also just really solidifies this as a concept, okay? So, um, Karen Erickson uh, decided to look at uh, core vocabulary uh, and identify this list of vocabulary words that are specific to learning in a K-12 classroom, okay? Uh, and so I'm gonna link here. Great. So what she's done is really great. She has um, taken a look at the words and the um, common core standards that are reflected here, right? And so you have a nice list of core vocabulary that's necessary in an academic classroom, okay? Uh, and 
Chris actually introduced me to this list, and uh, I've been using it. I've been using this the first forty words of list in my classroom in some planning, and I, I'm finding it really, really helpful. So, this is just another resource that you now have available for you um, that will aid in your planning and helps you actually identify which words that you want to teach. Okay, Michelle. Huh. Uh, we have a black screen. <laughs> oh, no. So it's not showing us. Are you looking at the internet? No. Nope. Are you looking at a document? What are you looking at? Yeah, I just linked to a document. Okay. Please. Huh. Um, is this a DLM uh, 40? Uh, it's the DLM core. And um, hmm. oh. are you back now? Yeah, yeah, you're back with the PowerPoint. Let's try one more time and see what I can do. Hang on. I did um, photocopy the first 40. Okay. Okay, good. So the first 40 gives you a look at what this is, this resource is. But if you go online, I think the link is also attached in the resources. Is that right? Yes. So if you go ahead and look at it there, you'll see how each of the um, – Core, the AAC core, um, has a priority score and uh, in terms of how many times it's coming up. And also it relates to the Common Core standards um, about when you might use it or teach it. So it, it's pretty helpful in that way. All right. Sorry about that. I hope my other links don't do the same thing. We're going to have to figure that out. Okay. So Let's talk about picture producers for a second. So some words clearly can be unambiguously illustrated, um, like apple or book, right? And a lot of these words are nouns. Um, other words cannot be uniquely represented by a picture. So these are two pictures that represent work, but they could also mean a lot of different things, right? So the meaning behind these pictures needs to be taught because they're not unambiguous. They're, they're ambiguous. Right? We don't know that hammer plus money is work until we describe that icon to the children and teach that icon to the children, right? Or work could mean doing your school work, right? And so um, it's, it's just important to understand, I think, when we talk about why um, CORE has not been the central focus of AAC systems, I think, again, this is one of the main reasons, right? Because it's very easy to represent with pictures a lot of nouns. It's harder to represent verbs and adjectives and adverbs. It's just, it's more difficult and, um, and so it doesn't get done as often, okay? And so I, that leads us to um, a quick chat about iconicity. Iconicity describes the relationship between a symbol and what it represents, okay? And I remember learning about this in my first AAC class and feeling um, really grateful that I had the information. Okay, so primary iconicity, um, the direct representation. Like a skateboard means skateboard. Um, secondary iconicity is an indirect representation. So this, this rabbit is very fast, okay? Transparent, um, again, is a direct representation. So this book is a book, and translucent might be a little bit more difficult to represent directly. So a book might mean reading, okay? And opaque is a symbol that's unrelated to meaning and must be memorized, like the very old list symbols or some of the other, um, some of the other symbols that are available in, in many systems that really need to just be memorized because it's very difficult to create any sort of causal relationship between the symbol and what it means, okay? And so just when you're thinking about putting icons in front of students, it's really important to think about what is the cognitive load? What is the expectation for that student when you put these um, <laughs> pictures in front of them and how might they get confused, okay? So um, I think what that really brings to mind to me is how well we teach the symbols that we are, um, that we're expecting the kiddos to know, right? And also 
um, and we're going to get to this more down the road, how important it is that the symbols remain in one place that, so that kids can establish motor patterns. They can really learn where they are instead of just relying on the visual cues. Okay, because some of these get tricky, okay? especially as we get into describing core words with symbols. Okay, so what core do we teach? What are the words? What are some initial lexical considerations? And how do we systematically add vocabulary and language structures? Okay. So if we know we need to teach core and we have a list of 350 words, where do we start and what's next and what's next? Okay. So um, can you see this on your screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. So probably everyone is familiar, many are familiar with um, Mayor Banaji's study of preschool students. She took language samples um, and of many preschool students across, I think, three different contexts. And um, what she came up with was this incredible list <laughs> that um, tells us that 96% of what the children say are these 23 words in a preschool setting, in a classroom. That's pretty big. And it's really indicative of, it really tells you why you need to work on teaching core. And I like this list because it is so small and so simple. And for typically developing preschool students, if this is what they're saying 96% of the time, these are words we need to teach right away, right? These are some of the first words that we need to look at teaching our kids because um, we don't have an example of atypical language development to follow. We really need to follow the path of typical language development when we're teaching, um, when we're teaching our children who use AAC. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Yeah. All right, so other resources to take a look at. Here's the DLM first 40. Uh, and um, so again, Karen Erickson's list of words that are important in the school setting, in an academic setting. Um, so it's, it's the core words, but it's also kind of cross-referenced with the CC, the Common Core State Standards. Okay. A couple of other places to look for great lists. Um, Yale Van Tatenhove has a list. Uh, it's called the Common Words List. And I'm going to try to link to it. I'm hoping that it doesn't create a black screen for you guys. Hang on. Oh, no. All right. Let me grab it from my other. Okay, can you see it now? No, it still just see your PowerPoint. Bummer. Um, shoot. Well, let me see what I can do here. So what this does, I'm just gonna describe this and we'll send it out as a link. This is, um, this is again, Gail Van Tatenhove's list. And she talks about the first 23 words, right, are the top words used by toddlers. So there's Mary Banaji's list at the top. And then there, is, there are clinical applications, the first words you might teach in a clinical setting, all done, help, want, mine, more, stop, that, and what. And then first 15 words, first 30 words, um, first 50 words, adding to the top 50. Right. And so she um, what she does is this nice progression. So if you're working on um, if you are working with a student who um, may have and you've worked on the first eight words, you now have a great list of words that you can work on next. OK. And I dude, I can have if this one is not in the resources link, Chris, I can send it out. OK. We'll give it to you. Okay. All right. Okay. 
And then Carol Zangari on her um, blog post has a year of core words. And what she does is she has it broken down into calendars so that you can teach a certain number of words per month. And she has it broken down by month. So there are lots of different ways to think about organizing this in the classroom so that you can be systematic in approaching teaching core. The Language Lab from PRC is another resource that has a list of core words um, that can be really helpful for you. Okay, so um, one really formative article um, is by Leahy and Bloom, and this is from the 70s, so, but it's a very good one. And they talk about um, how typical, typical speakers develop language. And they give some really good clues about which words we might want to think about teaching first and which words we might want to put off a little bit. So um, they talk about uh, in, a, in an initial lexicon, in an, in an initial lexicon, um, that we really don't want to include the word yes, that no comes first before yes. Um, and that really, before we can start to ask yes and no questions, we really need to be able, kids need to be able to make choices between preferred and non-preferred objects. Um, and so that bringing in of yes comes a little bit later. And I thought that that was, when I read this for the first time, I didn't know that. Um, the other thing that she talks about, um, that they talk about, uh, are introducing concrete before abstract words. And that doesn't necessarily mean nouns before verbs. So um, you might want to introduce words like eat or hug before you introduce words like hope or wish <coughs> because they're more easily, more concretely represented in pictures, right? They have better, they have easier iconicity. And uh, the other kind of big point that she, that they make in this article is the introduction of opposites. So um, when I first started teaching, I would introduce opposites as pairs, and then I read this article and now understand that in typical language development, that is not how opposites are learned. Um, it's learn the most salient of an opposite first. So wet is clearly a little bit <laughs> more concrete, and then they learn not wet, and then they learn dry. So big, not big, little. Dirty, not dirty, clean, right? And so some of those, especially when you're talking about descriptors, um, dirty, big, wet, these are great words to teach. And then it's fun to then introduce the opposite, not wet, and then comes in that um, the opposite vocabulary, okay? So those are just some initial lexical considerations from Leahy and Bloom. And, it's, and we can attach the article if anyone is interested in reading it, it's a good one. Okay, so we've I've talked about this already, but we need to use typical language development as a guide, okay? So we have the work of uh, Roger Brown and his stages of language development, which, um, I, which really shows you in these five stages when different kinds of vocabulary come in and when different word combinations come in and morphological structures come in in typical language development. And it's a nice guide for when we might introduce these kinds of language structures and, morph and morphological elements into our practice. Okay, now I'm worried that when I linked the quad, <laughs> it's not going to show up. Do you have the quad in front of you, everybody? No. No? Um, Sorry. Uh, okay, let's try. I wonder, let me try something different this time to see if it might work. Do you maybe want to breathe over it and maybe we could make a quick copy to share? Sure. So the quad means four, right? Here, I'm just going to pull it up and see if we can. Okay. 
All right, I'm gonna new share. How's this? There we go. Okay. Good. <laughs> So the quad means four, and it's written by Russell Cross, who's the resident wordsmith at Cranky Romick. And so the four sections that he covers are vocabulary, morphology, syntax, and function. So in, in vocabulary, you're going to get this list. Again, another resource, another list of uh, core vocabulary. This is alphabetical. Okay, so it's not in order of when you would teach it, but it's alphabetical. I prefer the other ones in terms of this part, the list of words. This is a nice list, but I like the order of introduction. It's a better format for me. Then it has the morphology checklist. So again, thinking about um, typical language development. And Roger Brown's work does this also. I just like the way that this is laid out. So we see on one side the age in which this morphological um, element comes in and then we see what it is the the morphology that is and so we can really take a look at when in what order we might want to teach these things right so we're going to teach the plural s and the possessive s before we before we teach the uncontracted copula okay so it gives you a nice roadmap for when you're going to teach um morphology and sentence types okay so here you um, you see that again the age that when it comes in the type of sentence and some examples so subject verb verb object subject object um, these guys come in first and you'll see that there that within these types of sentences there are different functions okay so you can you can see some directing of actions, go home, or some explaining of what the child is doing, eat dinner, or um, maybe some early possession, daddy car, or thinking about where something is, right? Shoe is under the table or on the table, right? Shoe table, um, and some early questioning. And then in the next round, you're seeing... Um, the sentence types get more and more complex. Okay. So again, this is a really nice way when you're planning what words and in what combinations you would want to teach those words to see when these come into play in typical language development because that's, that's really our guide for when we introduce this um, vocabulary and these language structures. Okay. Just like when you're teaching literacy, reading, um, when you introduce sounds, first you're going to introduce the m mm sound, and then the s sound, and the a ah sound. There's research-driven information about when you introduce the sounds because of a lot of different reasons, right? Utility, ability to combine, ease of saying them. So it's the same principle, right, that you would teach certain words first, right, and the same principle that you would teach um, certain word combinations before others and certain morphologies before others, okay? Because that scope, um, because we would need to define the scope and understand the sequence if we're going to best instruct the kiddos, okay? And then here we go. The last part of the quad, the fourth part, is the language functions. And so thinking about, again, when the functions of language come in. Now, a lot of them come in early, right? Instrumental, regulatory, interactional, and personal are early. So um, requesting things, asking for help, commanding others, information exchange, and um, maintaining contact or topic maintenance. These are all pretty early, but it's also, I think this is nice because when you're thinking about writing goals around how language is used, and combining core words in different ways, it's nice to think about having the kids combine in different ways so that they are learning different language functions, okay? 
they're not just always requesting things or not just always controlling others, but maybe they're working on topic maintenance or turn taking or um, um, interactional, excuse me, interactional functions, um, all with a two word utterance, right? Or a single word utterance. Okay, so that's why I like the quad. I'm gonna try to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I uh, remember when a long time ago, when I saw Bruce Picker for the first time, he said the foundation of the English language is subject, verb, object. And so thinking about keeping that in mind, that mu much of what we say is in this format, I like to provide examples um, for the kids as much as possible um, so that they have opportunity to create this language structure, right? Subject, verb, object. And there are so many books that support it. I love um, the books by Mo Willems. Um, they give so many good examples of this. Uh, you can do this in repetitive um, activities, you know, uh, throughout the day, but just keeping in mind that this is the foundation of the English language, that much of what we all say comes from this, and then of course gets more and more complex, but it comes from subject, verb, object. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about teaching with core vocabulary. So three things to keep in mind. We need to provide consistent, accessible vocabulary with a clear motor pattern. And we need to try to um, provide them with a whole bunch of it right away. Okay, we don't want to underestimate what the child will need, and we don't want to restrict access, okay, because it limits growth. And we really want to use CORE across language and communication functions and across activities and provide frequent opportunities for practice and generalization. Okay, and then the other thing that I always like to think about is that we move forward and circle back. We don't always have to wait for mastery, right? So we might teach some concepts and then we move forward and then we come back and get them again in another way, right? So let's take a look at these three um, bullets as we go through the next several slides, okay? So this is Carol Zangari's framework for semantic intervention. And Gretchen, I know that you do a really nice job of providing instructions for the different activities, written instructions for the different activities. And um, it's one thing that I really like to do too. And this framework is on my um, words I'm learning folder. Uh, it's part of the instructions. Okay, so introducing new words using focused aided language simulation. So this is the new word, how you get it, you know, and showing them the motor pattern so that they can access the vocabulary. And then we teach the new words with explicit instruction activities. Okay, so we really target those new words and the concepts behind those words with specific um, instructional activities. And then elaborating on new word meanings with engaging practice activities. Okay, so we're going to go back and support generalization by giving them a lot of repetition with variety. Okay, and then providing repeated exposure to new words on an ongoing basis. Okay, so if we are working on look, we're going to be working on that in so many different contexts throughout the day. And then we're gonna check for understanding and reteach as necessary, okay? So I really like this framework because it does bring home the need to teach in a lot of, teach these concepts in a lot of different contexts to, pro to provide repetition with variety, which leads to understanding and generalization from the students, okay? So some of the explicit reteaching or repetition with variety, this is just an example of more. So in my classroom, I have a lot of really, really emergent communicating guys. And so we did more and um, maybe last month we started teaching more. 
And um, these, these are some of the different ways that we taught more over the course of weeks when we introduced it, right? More of this or that, more money, more rain, it's been raining like crazy in California, more music, um, he has more or she has more than I do, um, that is more than I want, that's too much, that's more than I want, and we need one more. Okay, so the, the explicit teaching of, of more in all of these different contexts, and, um, and it's allowed the kids to really see this concept be shown in so many different ways, okay? And we also need to think about multiple meanings um, of these words um, that, like on, okay? So here's on with our Mayor Johnson symbol, and it could mean you have something on your head. You have a bird on your head. Could be that you're on a date. It could be that you're on a road trip, right? So we have to really think about, again, looking back at the symbols. Um, do they really reflect the meaning of these concepts in their entirety, okay? And the answer is usually not. And so that's why we need to provide these repeated exposures in lots of different contexts so that the kids can generalize. Because on doesn't just mean it's sitting on something, right? On a date, on a road trip, on fire, lots of different ways that you can think about the word on. Okay, so some strategies for setting goals and teaching core. So one of the things that I like to do is create learning targets that are um, kind of reflective of some IEP goals that kids are working on or of some longer term like monthly goals and then creating these word cards that support them. So for example, a language, um, oh, excuse me, a learning target would be I can use these words when I talk and write. Okay, so I would have on a, um, on a laminated piece of paper, I can use these words when I talk and I write. And then underneath them, underneath that, maybe tacked to the wall, I can have a Ziploc bag full of these word cards that we are working on. Okay, and then I can pull these cards out and use them in lots of different situations. So, for example, with more, we were, um, and we introduced this um, after we introduced more. So um, with more in this, in my baggie underneath my learning target, I can use these words when I talk and write. Um, we had lots of copies of more in this, and kids could put together and use eye gaze to make a sentence. They could use their talkers to recreate. Um, they could use their fingers to touch more of this in different contexts, okay? So it just gives a shared language and access to this vocabulary um, for your kiddos um, if you have it available, okay? And I'm gonna talk about the planning guide in a minute. Okay, here it is. So um, I just want you to look at the linguistic part at the very top here, um, the vocabulary, morphology, and language structures. But one of the other things that you can do when you are planning for teaching core is create a list of the core that you'd like to teach for this month or for this two week period or for this week long period. And um, so this is an example of um, a girls communication, um, communicative competence planning guide and the vocabulary that she's working on. Now she's a more advanced communicator. She's combining three words. So the vocabulary she's working on is the, it's in the context of um, her classroom environment and they are going to meet service dogs, okay? Uh, and so some of the vocabulary, the core that she's gonna need are wash, stink, clean, brush, his, her, I plus am, he, he, she plus is, and then her category words are body parts and hygiene. She already has a lot of the, more, the early morphology, like um, um, plural S and um, possessive S and some of those other early um, morphologies. And so now she's working on the present progressive ING ending. And here we have 
some sentence structures that she's working on, okay? So this is nice because, again, it gives you a shared language around what this child is working on this week or this couple of weeks or this month. These are the words that we're really going to try to target. And that, again, gives everybody, it gives the teachers and the speech therapists and the staff a really nice um, reminder to stay focused and to give the child lots of opportunities for repetition with variety. Okay. Here's another one. This is an early, uh, an early communicator with, then this, these are some initial lexicon, initial lexical considerations. So here you see, again, maybe, and pulled directly from uh, Banaji's list, more, go, mind, stop, read, no, eat, that. These are the words that we're gonna be working on with this child who is a really emergent communicator. This is, um, these are some things that he needs to be working on, okay? And our language structures, we're going to increase single words and maybe start some word combinations. A good goal is to increase single words, right? When you're just starting out. Or some gesture, word plus gesture sign combinations. That's another really good goal, okay? Uh, so I shared this framework with um, a team in Connecticut this fall, and they have, taken it and run with it. And so this is what they, this is an example of how they've kind of changed it a little bit so that um, it looks, um, it's easy for them to send home and mom and dad know what they're talking about at school. Okay, so they've defined everything in red. So linguistic is respect, respective and expressive language, learning and using vocabulary, sentence structure and pre-programmed messages and increasing number, variety and complexity. So they've got their, IEP goal that's kind of, it's kind of condensed there. So mom and dad know these are the words and this is that are going with this goal, okay? And they've got their social stuff down below, okay? And I'm gonna have to go out again to link to this one for you, just a minute. I think now I've figured it out though, so that's good. Okay, so this is what they, can you see this now? Yep. So what this team has done for this kiddo is um, this is another thing they have sent, they now send home to family and that goes with him to his private speech. So language competency planning, this is the, this December. This week's vocabulary works well with Christmas. Put uses, put it on a surface, put cookies on the table for Santa, put it on the desk, put it in a container, put it in a Christmas stocking, put it in a box, put Put it in the backpack, put up with something, um, put up with the noise, put up with the crowd, right? So they've really taken this um, planning guide and made it their own, and I love it. They've done such a good job. And this kiddo is, he's just making so much progress um, because they really, as a whole team, have this shared language around the words that they're working on, and they are really explicit about when they're gonna teach him to use these words and the concepts behind them. And so for this, um, let's see if I can, I don't know why I can't scroll down, why not? Okay, here we go. Leave, give, okay. And here's their morphology. Okay. Verb tenses during activity, we will walk, we are walking, we walked. And uh, this, this guy is just, he's just doing so well. They sent me some videos of him this morning and I'm so excited. Um, but I, I really do think that when we have shared goals and everyone knows what we're working on and we give the kids a lot of chances to practice in a lot of different contexts, good things happen, okay? All right, let's see if I can get back to my. Uh oh. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, here's another way of this is another way that I. I um, plan for literacy and core in the classroom. So this looks a little bit different. It's, it's just a planning guide 
for vocabulary, right? For core vocabulary um, and for vocabulary that's important to my unit. So this is a unit plan. So this unit um, was from Unique Learning Systems and it was called It, Hear It, Describe It or something like that. And um, so what I did is I looked at this big long unit and I tried to figure out, okay, what are the core words? Uh, what are the important words? Now this is with a group um, that was pretty, was a little bit more advanced linguistically, right? So we were working on some words that were core, but some that were our real focus here was um, the core plus a descriptor, okay? So look, smells, sounds, feels, taste, plus all of these different kinds of descriptors, and little and wet and loud and full. Um, these are all core words. And then our negation, not plus above, right? And then I included some of the words that we were working on for sight words for this other little group and connection, um, sorry, reading comprehension goals. We were working on connections and visualization and some early phonics stuff. So you can plan in lots of different ways. There's no one, you know, you've seen that um, Harrison's team really took that planning guide and changed it so that it worked for them, okay? And this is just another way that you can do it in a unit-based way. I'm sorry, I didn't do this. Hi. Okay. So the same, um, oh, it was called using our senses. <laughs> so in this way, we, you know, I had a, you can see the learning target down below. It says, I can tell you uh, the parts of my body I use to smell, see, hear, feel, see, and taste. I say see twice. And then there's another learning target under there that I can't see. This was posted on our wall in the classroom. And so we would learn Clearly at this point, we've talked about things, um, descriptors around seeing, and we've talked around, talked about, we're starting to talk about descriptors around hearing, um, but the kiddos are then being able to categorize words, which is another part of the common core in uh, the, it's a kindergarten standard and a first grade standard. So category, categorizing words um, and using the core standards in that way, we were able to bring that in and, uh, and it's a nice visual way of bringing that all together. Okay. So um, just a word about teaching concepts. Now we've already kind of talked about this publicly at Nauseam, but I really think that it's so important that the kids understand the concepts behind the words and that the words can mean different things in different um, situations. And so, um, I really like to try to bring these things to life. And one of, I love mobile lamps again. One of the ways that we do that in our classroom is we have the, uh, we have Gerald and Piggy talk to each other. And then we have Gerald and Piggy uh, puppets that act out what's happening. Um, and so this is one way that we can really play act some of the words. So if we're working on go or stop or more or like, this week we start, um, we're doing a, a look up in the sky unit right now. And so this work, this week we're working on um, concepts of look and up and um, fast is coming next week. Uh, so these are the, these are, this is one way that you can really bring things to life is you can play act what they're, what these characters are doing um, around the core. Okay. So here we have, um, this is the uh, low tech system you see up there is a modified version of Gail Van Tatenhove's Pixon project. And so coming in, I started in the classroom in, um, in, the, first, in the first week of December, and uh, we didn't have a unified language for a lot of the kiddos. Um, and so we made these um, Pixon project boards um, in, for individual students and then made a big one for the wall. And it gives a visual representation for when I'm talking with the kids. So we're, we're working on looking up and we have things on the ceiling that the kids can look up and see. And then we have these books that, that we've made that um, talk about things that you might see when you look up, okay? So in, in the book, it might just be a giant picture of the sun. And when, but when we're talking about it, we're going to say, you know, this is, I don't know if you could wear my, 
hands are in the screen, but you can say, this is hot, this is hot. Or, um, you know, look up, look up, you know, this is hot. So we have a visual representation and an established motor pattern that the kiddos can learn in order to learn the vocabulary that we're talking about, okay? So another thing that um, I really like to do is these writing activities with CORE, and again, um, this highlights that subject verb object that we were talked about earlier. Uh, this is a this is a uh, wordless book called Pancakes for Breakfast, and we did this um, the first weeks back from Christmas break. First, we learned first we learned about all the characters, so we did some character analysis: um, the woman, the chickens, the cow, the dog, and the cat. And we talked about salient features of all of those guys, and um, we watched videos of uh, uh, cows being milked and chickens laying eggs. They didn't want to assume too much in terms of background knowledge. And then we read this wordless book. And, um, and what we're doing now is in our writing, we are taking individual pictures and we're using icons to write the story and then when they and they've written they've each written some pages of the story and then we will publish the book that's been written and so i might say who is in this picture or who is the who is doing the action in this picture and give them some choices the woman or the dog or the chicken uh, in the top picture maybe and they'll choose the woman what is she doing and then they have their icon for read which we've already worked on, their icon for um, go, and their icon for maybe more. And so she read what? And then, you know, is it a book or is it, I don't know, you know, an iPad. And so then they get to do some, for some of these early communicators that are not yet using um, the system, we can do it in, in terms of choice making for kiddos who are using systems more regularly, they can use their talkers. Uh, so we do a lot of writing with CORE. This is a more complex um, map for writing. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to show you a video now where you'll see that this child um, is has this attached to the bottom of his accent so that he has a cue or what kind of word might come next. Okay. Um, so let's take a look. You guys let me know if you can hear it and see it. One, two. Okay. I'm watching. It already happened. So, so he says, I wanted. And my co teacher says, oh, it already happened. Because I want, do we need another verb like I want to go or I want to, or do we need an object, a what or a who? Because I want to, oh, so you must be giving me another green verb. Because I want to. What do you want to do? Because I want to. Mm -hmm. Oh, because I want to play. So Seth is giving him a lot play. of verbal rehearsal because I Just want to play. Just a second, to, I have a question to ask. Because I want to play. Because so I he want says to play. play. Mm -hmm. 
Are you thinking about a person? A who? Or are you thinking about what? Play with what or play with who? Or play in. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing a great job because I want to. You think maybe you need an object. I want to play in maybe what? It's recess at this time of video, so it's a little hectic. <laughs> Mr. Harrington about Drake being in <laughs> and so now Drake is playing the drums. Do you think it might be a good idea for mom to come and speak with Mr. Harrington about you being in the band? instruments that can be adapted. Which instrument are you most interested in? There's drums. There's like you play drums, huh? There's cymbals. and drums. Oh, goodies. Goodies. Oh, interested in? Oh, he's walking the room. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was in trouble. Oh, you're, like you're interested in the piano. Oh, are you going out? You are most interested in the piano. Okay, so I I think I like this for a lot of reasons. I think uh, Steph does a really wonderful job of um, providing him with that verbal rehearsal. He says something and she kind of reminds him of what he's already said because that's one of the things that's hardest for him is to kind of hold in his head what he has already said because it does, his access is so hard. Um, it just takes quite a while for him to create a full sentence. But when she, you know, gives him that practice of holding it in your head and repeating it in your head, that um, the phonological loop, then it allows him to really hold on to what he said. I think the other important thing to say here is because I want to play in band, that's seven words and six of seven is core, right? Um, and so I think that's also just a really good testament of utility that he's and, and use of core to get across a message. Um, he was able to correct from he said, I wanted, and um, Steph cued, oh, it already happened, and he went back and said, no, I want. Um, so I just think um, that this is a nice example of using core well <laughs> in the system, and um, clearly he knows the motor patterns um, associated. He knows where the symbols are and the wait time associated with them. He's used the system now for a couple of years. Um, and his access is, just keeps getting trickier as it does sometimes. Um, but uh, he's, he knows where everything is because the uh, motor patterns remain the same. And he's using MinSpeak. And uh, so the vocabulary doesn't change locations. It just always remains the same. And each word is only in one place. Okay, And that makes it easier to learn the core. <laughs> All right. So um, I borrowed this slide from It's Not Rocket Science, which is a class that Kara Bitstrup and I um, put together and teach for PRC. Um, this, um, so Isabel Beck writes about three tiers of vocabulary. Tier one words are common um, known words like problem, change, help, or happy. So those are your core words, right? Tier two words are more advanced academic curriculum words used by mature language users, um, such as conundrum, modification, assist, or elated. And tier three words are technical words whose frequency of use is low and limited to specific domains like atom, molecule, or equator. So general education quickly begins to focus on tier two and tier three words because the core words, the tier one words, have for typically developing speakers already been acquired, right? So the setting in school focuses on tier two and, th and three words because the kiddos who generally enter school with typical language development already have acquired the core words. Okay? And so the challenge is how do we work on tier one words in the context of an environment that focuses on tier two and tier three, right? How do we work on those core words in an environment the kiddos are being mainstreamed or you're providing access to the general curriculum that's focused on those higher level words, okay? And so this brings us to referential and descriptive teaching, which you will learn more about in the second training. I think it's the second training, Chris, with impact. Is that right? Third. It's the third training with impact. So you'll learn more about this, but referential teaching asks questions like, what planet is this? And the target answer is referential. The student has to answer Saturn, right? Which of course means that you have to program Saturn and Pluto and Mercury and Mars and all of the other names of the planets into the system, right? Descriptive teaching kind of flips the question, right? The question uses the referent and requires a descriptive response. So instead, you ask, tell me about Saturn, and it has big rings, right? So that's all core. So you can, you can really think about the way that you teach and change the way that you teach so that you require a descriptive response or a response 
that um, is full of core instead of fringe. Okay, and this is a Bruce Baker slide that I like the name of, so I borrowed it. Um, the illusion of inclusion, um, that's his, the rest of it, I made that. <laughs> um, so if the teacher says to the student who uses AAC in the general ed classroom, what planet is the largest in our solar system? And that student has these um, buttons that are programmed and they say, Jupiter is big, I love Jupiter, Jupiter is a gas giant. So this is the illusion of inclusion, right? Because they're participating, but are they learning, right? So instead, tell me something about Jupiter. It is big, it is round, it has rings. They are small and dark. The inside is hot, it has clouds. They can be blue, brown, white, red. It has wind, it has four moons, it is fifth from the sun, it is made of gas, right? These um, answers, are just full of core. Okay. So when we talk about descriptive talking, we're really thinking about defining a concept or a word that is not available to you on your board or on your system with words you do have available. So lots of ways to do this, right? I mean, and again, this is not something that maybe the kids are gonna do out of the blue. This is requires modeling. So you're going to go back to that Carol Zangari slide um, where first you teach aided in language intervention, right? Like it is big. First you show them where those words are and this is what you might say to describe Jupiter. It is big. And then you go in and you provide opportunities to learn, um, excuse me, um, to, uh, to teach them about Jupiter, about big things. Okay. Um, so you follow that path um, that she talks about uh, and the other one of, one other thing you can do is teach word strategy so it's not this way or it's like this thing or it starts with this sound so you can teach strategy okay and um, yeah so what we really want to think about is how do we define a concept or a word that is not available okay so Let's just keep in mind these words, doctor, stir, and restaurant. And can you see this on your screen? Yeah. Okay, so looking at these words, these are the 50 Pixon Project, 50 core words. How do you describe doctor? Okay, I'll, I'll bail you out on the first one. Maybe something like help. Yeah, sick. Help. You see help down here? I don't know where if you can see where my I can't see myself. So, um, help me when I sick. Or help me. Anything else you can think of for doctor? Make good. Make good? Totally. Maybe go there. Okay. Yeah, we go there. Perfect. Yep. Look good. Mm hmm. Make me not sick. Okay, let's try stir. This is an easy one. Yeah. Turn it. Mm -hmm. Now I've forgotten the last one I was going to have you do. Restaurant. Mm hmm. Sorry, I didn't hear you. We want eat. Yeah. Go to eat. Yep. Yeah. We want eat. So just it's I, I think that it takes a minute to kind of think about it, but 
when you um, you can really define a lot of words with just a few core words, okay? And you know, clearly um, there is a place for fringe, right? I mean, I always, always include all of the names of the kids in the class on kids' systems, all the teachers, all the family members, the name of the dog, the favorite book, you know, like the things that are really, really important, right, and motivating. You have to also include some fringe. Uh, and this system, this is just the core, the core 50, but there are also flipped flipper things at the top that include many other words, like descriptive words and bridge words or prepositions, right? But there's a lot here that you can do with just a few core words so that you can really teach the concepts of the core words. And I might argue that understanding the concept of Pluto is more important than being able to name Pluto. Okay. All right. So let's give it a go. I'm going to, we don't have to use the core 50, but um, think about how you might describe these tier two words, right, with core words. So rocket, ship, colander, orbit, migration, dinosaur, author, mountain, glacier. Maybe just pick five that you want to work on. Um, and when you're working on them, Keep in mind a particular student. Is this student working um, with like an initial core um, vocabulary? Are they more advanced? Are they going to start to combine with two or three words? So keep a student in mind when you're doing it. Um, and so when you're approaching that student, you might teach three word phrase to describe mountain. Or you're approaching a different student and you know, and you know that they need a two word phrase to describe colander. Okay? I'll give you just a couple minutes to uh, pick some words and give it a go. Um, does everybody have a few words written down that you're going to work on? Yes. Yeah. Michelle, can we um, oh, go back? Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Wait. Wait. Okay. So write like five words down. And then, and then I'll ask you to I just think it's good to practice, right? Yeah, absolutely. We just need a just device to do it. Yeah, here, um, let me let me pull something up for you, okay? What, you guys are mostly using touch chat, is that right? Yeah, if you pull up a 60 or a 40 something. Does that work? Yeah. Whoops. Yeah. Just to buy them from this? Yeah. You can try it with this, you know. This one, this might be a little tricky because, well, yeah, give it a go. Remember, it doesn't have to describe it. It could either be words like you do or I think it could be 
You need a bit kind of now. Yeah. Or either But you could, I like, I don't like. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, and you know what? You would with like with a dinosaur, maybe you would have to get into your describing words, you know, big and old. So are you again, saying, but again, that's part of core, right? Because this because core is not just verbs and little words. It's also describing words and like adjectives and adverbs, right? Way of thinking about it, yeah. It's using the most common words, the core words, to describe a less common word. Um, Gretchen, I think you have. Um, I'm not going to remember, but you showed me the, the bead thing <laughs> when I was there um, to describe vocabulary, what it does. I would feel. I don't. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Water. Right. We're avoiding 
you can totally use nouns. <laughs> it's remember that in core, 80%, 75, 75 to 80% of what we say is core, right? But there's still that additional 25% and that's okay to use it. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're just trying to really shift our thinking away from what is this and shifting the question to tell me about, tell me more about what does it do? What does it look like? So for example, I don't know if rings, I'm guessing rings is not in the top 350 words, but it has rings is better for me than when I ask, you know, tell me about Saturn is better than what planet is this? You know, you could say it has things go around, right, instead of rings. Are we good? Yeah. All right, I think we're good. Okay, cool. I'm going to go back, 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 back. Okay. Um, all right, who wants to share out a few? Who did Rocket? I did Rocket. Okay, what is it? What's a rocket? That go up. Yep. Totally, it goes up. We did Rockets in our classroom this last week. It was super fun. It goes up. Uh, ship. Big loud fire. <laughs> 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 you big loud fire, totally. Um, awesome. Any more rockets? Okay, how about ship? Go in water. Go fast in water. Go in water, go fast in water. Sit in it in water. Awesome. Jump. Okay. <laughs> Any more ship? I did. I put that was hard. Water out, get out wet, up down out. Sorry guys, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Where where are we? Uh, we were talking about colander. Oh, okay. What did you come up with? Water out, get out wet. Mm -hmm. Yep. It go through. Go through. That's good. It goes through. Cool. All right. How about orbit? Go around. Go around and around. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, um, any more orbit? Okay, how about migration? <laughs> Nobody did that. Go together. <laughs> all go together. They all go together, same way. Same right? Um, dinosaur. Old, old, big, big, old, old. Yeah, big yeah. and old, right? <laughs> and not here. Not home, you know, not here any longer, not not home. Um, okay, no more. Okay, how about author? Yeah. Now it doesn't mean, now you might put author on a kid's system, right? Because author is something that they're going to talk about from kindergarten to 12th grade and beyond, right? So you might end up putting author in there, but it's also nice to know that they know what an author is. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and that they can use words to describe what an author is. Okay, how about mountain? Um, on top, big rock. I go up. Yeah, I go up. Totally. Fun, happy, cold, like play. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about glacier? Big ice, big wet, cold water. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a kid that said, worry no more. <laughs> Evaporate. All gone, no more. All gone. Yep, no more. Go away. Totally. Perfect. Precipitation. Yep, wet come down. Is that what you said? Wet come down. Perfect. Election? <laughs> yeah. Um, we actually, so the kiddo that you saw in the video, um, uh, was telling us yesterday, I don't like minister, because minister is in, you know, the PRC systems. I don't like minister. And we were like, huh, because this little guy loves to go to church. And we were like, did the, did the minister at St. Lawrence Hotel change? No. <laughs> I don't like, I don't like, like minister. And I was like, huh. And we got it eventually, of course. Like, he didn't like who had been inaugurated. And, um, and so we ended up programming um, President Obama and President Trump into the system. And that's, again, okay. There are times that you can, and, you, and it will be necessary to put uh, fringe words into the system. Um, and, and that's okay. But I also think, you know, really important to not overdo that and um, to focus more on the concepts behind. And I think that this kiddo um, did a good job because, you know, we were able to get what he was trying to talk about, even though it was with another fringe word. Still, it's those word finding skills, right? Um, okay, polar bear. So in this, like in the unit that I'm thinking about, um, we did some, this is years ago, right? But we did um, uh, animals that were going to be extinct if the, if the glacier was no more. And so that was what we did is we talked about big animals that would be no more if the, you know, when we talked about um, the glacier um, going away. So that was the context for that one. Okay, last one, spatula. Turn over, look up, look down. Mm -hmm. Big help. <laughs> okay, I can't hear you very well, but turn over food. Did I hear that? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so you guys, it gets easier with time, believe me, and you get more confident in your responses. <laughs> and, um, and you can get across a lot of meaning using the core vocabulary. And at the very, very least, I would say, at least before you teach these words, make sure you understand. Um, how you are going to describe them with words they have on their system. Even if you end up programming them, it's not the end of the world. Now, I, again, I don't suggest that you program lots and lots and lots of fringe words because it just gets overwhelming. It's too many for them to load, to kind of go through, especially in category-based systems where they then have to alphabetize and more hits and more pages and you know, that kind of thing. But now there will be these words like, that I think Karen Erickson talks about this a little bit, that they're going to have to use throughout their academic career, like author, or illustrator, or hypothesis, or whatever. But they also need to know 
what they mean and how to use other words to talk about them, how to use core words to talk about them, okay? We good? All right, so review so far. We talked about what core vocabulary is and where it comes from. It comes from the study of words, of corpus linguistics. And then we take from these big samples of words, both written and spoken words, and we do an analysis on them and we see, okay, there are 350 to 400 common core words that we use 80% of the time, 75% to 80% of the time when we're talking. And that is across context. That's people in Australia on their lunch breaks that work in the food service industry, preschool students, um, elementary age students, students with disability. There have been a couple studies now about students with disability. In fact, students who use AAC, um, the ones who become competent communicators, and that's the big caveat, right? The ones that achieve communicative competence really know core, okay? And in terms of core in AAC, we talked about how overwhelmingly as a field, we, um, in, the, in the history of AAC, um, as a field, we have programmed a heck of a lot of fringe words in category-based systems. And that what we need to learn from corpus linguistics is that core is the focus of what we teach and provide access to because it really does allow our kids to become competent communicators. Okay? We also have learned um, around core and AAC about different tools that you can access. There are materials links that, um, that Chris has sent you. You can look to that Gail Van Tatenhove's first words, um, the DLM core from Karen Erickson, you can look at um, the Pranky web, the Pranky Romic website has great lists of core words. Uh, the Quad Profile has a list of core words, but also a really nice progression of how those words become combined. Okay. Um, so we have a lot of resources that help us establish what is the initial lexicon, where do we go from there, and what's next. Okay. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about teaching with core and an introduction to descriptive talking and descriptive teaching. And you're going to get a, a, a more complete <laughs> um, lesson on that. Um, I think with Debbie Witkowski, who is amazing, she does such a wonderful job bringing together descriptive teaching with Bloom's taxonomy, which is really a really super cool way to learn it. Um, I got to hear this talk, and it is so good. So I'm excited for you. Um, okay, so um, we also talked about, in terms of teaching with CORE, how we plan, right, and give shared language, and how we provide lots of repeated opportunities for kids to learn. You remember the more slide, you know, and the different ways of talking about on. Um, there are lots of different ways that you need to provide access to the meaning, to the concept behind the vocabulary. Okay, and if you can provide that repetition with variety and all be on the same page around what kind of core words that you're teaching this week or this month, um, you're really going to see the kids start to use them more um, meaningfully, right? Okay, and then also in the context of these curricular units or theme-based units, um, you can use so much core to describe some of Isabel Beck's tier two or tier three words, okay? And when you're planning, you can really highlight what core words, you know, that fit within the realm of what you're teaching now um, are gonna work, okay? So like right now I am, I'm working on looking up, you know, look up in the sky is our unit. And so we're going to be teaching, um, we've already taught go in a previous unit and more and um, stop and a couple of others, and now we're working on, and we've taught this, and now we're working on um, uh, fast and up and uh, big and pretty and some other really, really important core words that we can use in context because we can describe a rocket as something that goes up and an astronaut is the person who goes up and um, a bird goes up and 
to fly means to go up, right? And so you can see that we get to use these words to describe a lot of things um, in our unit. And the planets go around and they are far away. And um, which one is the biggest? and the smallest. And you can also see how you can differentiate your instruction there. So a kiddo who is using big, great, it's big. But you can also work on superlatives for that kiddo who's working on biggest, right, or smallest. Okay, all right, so um, these are three areas that I thought of um, that, you know, we have like, we have about 23 minutes. So. These are three areas that I kind of thought of and Chris thought of um, that we might want to discuss, but we can also take it in any direction that you guys would like to go. Do you want me to run through these quickly and see if anything pops up? Yeah, sure. Okay. so. What are the literacy requirements of the symbols your students are using? What strategies are in place for helping students use core across language functions and activities and lesson or unit planning? Okay, so when you think about literacy requirements, okay, so if your child cannot read, is not literate, which one of these means I'm excited? And which one means I want that. And which one means um, I'm so happy. <laughs> right. And which one means um, gosh, what did what did it mean? Oh, which one means my heart is happy. <laughs> right. So I mean, the point is. If these symbols, they, they all look the same, right? I mean, they could all mean kind of a similar thing. And so you have to really think about the literacy requirements of the symbols that you're using in your classroom, right? Because if the child is dependent on um, the picture, it better stay in the same place. Because if these things move around, can you imagine trying to figure out which one is which when you're looking to tell the difference between the smiley face and the big smiley face or the open mouth smiley face that has a white smile and the open mouth smiley face that has a pink smile? So I think it's, a, I just think when you think about literacy requirements, you also really have to think about motor planning and making sure that in your child's system, in the student's system, that stuff isn't moving around everywhere. Because kids can learn symbols and they can learn to differentiate them. But if they're only if they're only using a visual of the picture and they're jumping around everywhere, it's pretty hard to figure out which one is which. And I just think that's a nice I I like to be reminded of that too, because you know, I often depend on reading what the symbols mean in order to understand what they mean when I'm teaching, right? Oh, that's the quickest and easiest way for me. Well, I'm literate. Right? Okay. And so for a child who isn't literate, how can we best help them uh, so that it doesn't get so complex and so confusing? And the one thing that I really think about is um, making sure that they stay in the same place. Okay. All right. And here's just another literacy requirement. What if it's in another language? So for your, I, I just pulled a Spanish um, overlay, but if your child who is in his, um, so you have a child who comes into your classroom, we had a little guy that came from Algeria and did not speak English, and so, but his system was in English. Or you've got a family that you send the system home and they don't have, um, and they don't speak the same language. You just have to be aware of these considerations um, and so and and how you can modify your teaching so that you can really best address the needs right so again keeping things in the same place you know not having symbols appear and disappear this is a really good way to combat those literacy requirements okay 
Um, so again, so that's, I've been talking about already, but the role of motor planning is so important when you have to consider the literacy requirements of symbols. And um, I don't know, we can talk about monosemia and polysemia in AAC um, a little bit. So monosemia means one symbol for one word, okay? So that means mine. <laughs> and polysemia means many meanings for each symbol but you use more than one symbol to make meaning. So word, so combinations of symbols make meaning. So the name tag plus the girl means mine. The name tag um, plus the boy might mean his, right? So, but it, um, you have to think about how many symbols you would need if one symbol equals one word versus being able to combine symbols. How many, how many, how many, fewer symbols you might need in order to create words, okay? This is just like our real brief overview, but I think it's important to consider, right? That there are, um, that there are implications for the systems we choose and for the layouts and vocabulary structures that we choose. And there are implications for the students and how they learn them and how many pictures they have to navigate and, um, how many hits they have to get to to get things, and whether or not they must use literacy to understand the symbols, because the symbols are so similar that the only way to differentiate is, is with the words on top, and if that's even a good fit for the kid, right? So I just, I just like to kind of bring these points up because not to muddy the waters, but just to have an awareness of what's going on with your kiddos when they see their symbols and when they're learning. Okay. Um, all right, so core language across um, functions and activities. I know you guys are using a lot of core. How, how is it going? You know, what, what are you seeing that's working? Um, what is a challenge? I, I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. She, go ahead. Um, just having the kids engage with the device. Okay. It's, it's just a challenge to get them to use it. Okay. Yeah, that can be, you know, that definitely happens. <laughs> Um, one thing that I found, and I've definitely encountered that before, one thing that I found that really works is to teach the concept first. So if you're teaching Go, you really teach that concept first. And then they give them the power to make things go with their system, right? So if they understand that they're going to get to do that, like they're going to get to do the thing that's fun, if you make <laughs> the... Uh, the concept real to them first, then introduce the system and the vocabulary that gives power to the language, right? Then um, I've seen that that can be a successful way to kind of mediate that. So, you know, for example, I mean, we've got one little one and uh, in our classroom who, um, you know, he's just got this low tech system that we've made, this core 50. Um, board with a flip book at the top and um, he really only uses it at this point now when um, when he gets to direct the actions of others and and he's starting he's starting to kind of use it for different functions but he loves to direct the actions of others he loves to be able to do the things you know and that he understands um, that he's learned from our instruction that he can do with his words. You know, he can get more of something. He can get more balls thrown at the teacher. You know, we did um, the Mo Willems book um, uh, about the, now I'm gonna forget what it's called, but um, about the, the snake that comes to play. I want to play with my new friend. And uh, in the book, they Gerald and Piggy try to play catch with a snake who has no arms. And um, so, I am the teacher and I pretend I am the snake with no arms and the te and the kids get to throw like little soft balls at me um, 
when they say go. And they learn that they get to do that, and you, bet, you better believe that they know where that word is and what it means. Okay? So I think, you know, and again, I, I don't know what the, what the makeup of your population is right now, but um, for these, especially for these early, early communicators that are just starting to learn some core words and just starting to use their systems, it's, it, it's about making it real. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, does that seem like it might be an avenue you want to go down, or is it a bigger question than that? Did I miss it? No, that's good. Okay. Um, any other questions? Just to take on to what you said, Michelle, um, I think that one of our little friends who's super, he, he will use his device to do things that are motivating to him and um, that he prefers, which a pretty limited amount of things. Mm -hmm. um, getting to him to expand beyond that has been pretty tricky. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I think that's what we're talking about motivation. It's just finding more motivating things. It's probably less so than for itself. No, it's a tricky one. I mean, if you think about the um, the the research on communicative competence and the major, major role of those psychosocial factors of motivation and, um, you know, kind of just that ability to get beyond things that are really hard. Um, I think um, it's, it can be a super challenge, right? And there are some kids that are a lot more motivated to communicate than others. And, um, you know, it's, it can be it can be kind of frustrating, you know, when you work so hard on a lesson and they're not doing it, darn it. <laughs> but um, I think you know it's just kind of that. Sometimes you know, and Gretchen, I know you guys use a lot of peer models. Um, that can be a really good way to get buy-in and motivation um, for some kids. For other kids, that's that is not the right move. Um, yeah, it's a it's definitely a tricky one. Can I jump in real quick? Uh, just a little something that I learned a long time ago. It was this really nifty equation where motivation had to be greater than the combination of the physical and cognitive demands that the system was putting on, on their communication system. So if you were struggling with motivation to communicate, I always then went back and looked at, is there any way for me to bring down the cognitive demand and or lower the physical demand? That's a really smart formula, Chris. That always helped me. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Can you, Michelle, can you give us a couple more? I feel like go is a really easy one to, <laughs> to implement and start to do like for a very basic communicator maybe a couple of other core word examples sure so um we did look this week do you guys is that a good one they, mostly i would say they all have look they have look we're doing fast next week uh, we're also doing, we did up this last week we did we're gonna do fast and big next week um, uh, gosh, um, you know, the complexity, let's see, it just depends on the kiddos, right? Um, so like the kiddo that you saw in the video learned because the other about three weeks ago, and that's a tricky one, right? How do you teach because? <laughs> um, and so Steph told me that what she did is she did some causal relationships. This happened because of this. Um, and she showed him a whole bunch of causal relationships. And then she had him practice um, using um, three word combinations, this because this, this because this, in lots of different, um, in lots of different um, contexts. And he nailed it. And you'll actually see in the video, he says, because I want to, you know, he, uh, he had erased before I started um, 
writing, um, he erased mom's school because I want to. So um, I think with more abstract things, you know, you're at a higher level of cognition, you're at a higher level of um, skill at that point, and so the lessons look a little bit different. With the really easy to demonstrate ones, like go and stop and more and turn and um, help and you know, it's, it's just a matter of really thinking through for each one of those, how can you make it meaningful for the kiddos? Like, we did help, um, I remember many years ago, uh, and uh, so we had the students help each other finish this, you know, this series of things. They helped each other, they helped each other, they helped each other. Then they helped me finish a series of things. And then they... Um, went and um, they asked other people if they need help. And so they, you know, they just, it's just a matter of taking whatever it is that you might want to be teaching and, um, and providing a lot of examples and repetitions in different contexts with that vocabulary. I don't know how helpful that was. Um, I think to be- Do you have a word in mind? <laughs> I think those are the trickier, like the because example was great. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for example, when you're talking about, so I've got one kiddo right now that's starting to use, um, so verb plus two verb, right? So like want to go, want to play, want to sing, um, like to hear, that kind of combination. Um, and so it's pretty, it's nice on the, he's on a, this is a different kiddo, he's on a print to rummage system. And um, with the way they have the verb tenses set up, it's pretty easy to teach verb tense because you've got, um, because it's always in the same place for every single verb. But you can, and I, I don't know exactly how it is in terms of uh, the um, touch chat, but. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why ing is all right there. Okay. Yeah. So if you're teaching verb tense of ing and it's all in the same place, um, so then you can do repeated book readings. He is washing. She is painting. He is running. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can hit these. And clearly they become less physical when you get into verb tense or when you get into um, more um, conjunctions and that kind of thing. You, you can have big physical displays for adjectives and verbs, um, but when you're getting into more complex la language, um, it becomes more of providing opportunities to show the relationship with the words in different ways. I hope that helps. <laughs> It, it becomes more academic at that point. Um, okay, I see we have about five minutes left. So any other questions at this point or should I kind of move forward a little bit? Go ahead. Okay. So the cognitive load of multiple symbol sets. This is something Chris brought up, and um, I think that it's really, really important to think about because there are kiddos with a lot of, you know, with different systems in the same classroom, okay? And they're different, working on different language organizations, uh, different numbers of buttons, different icon sequences, right? And then often even different, um, different symbols. And so what do you do? Right? And I think the simplest explanation is to model that translation and really um, help kids understand the concept behind. And again, I think providing those opportunities, um, you know, this is reflective of that more slide that I had before. So here's the sign language more, more juice, more beans, more music, right? So these are lots of different ways of saying more and just being as explicit um, as you can with and and speaking your mind out loud, speaking your thinking out loud 
uh, as you go through and say, oh gosh, well on Joey's system, he has this picture of the, the sign with the music symbols. The person who drew this picture was thinking he might want more music, and that was a good way. This, is, this symbol that's on this um, low-tech board is a big pile of beans, and there are more beans over here. You know, so just really being explicit and modeling the translation and the concept behind everything will promote that generalization. This is another thought around symbols. Um, yeah. So I think that is it, unless anybody has any questions moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, Michelle, I'll be in touch. Okay, thanks. All thanks, right. Michelle. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> See if I can get out of here.